<laughs> okay, this is Giovanni Strada, who is going to uh, make his pitch presentation that he did in the Harvard Pitch Competition. Go ahead. All right, so before we dive in, I know you guys heard this already. So my background, um, undergrad mathematics and Spanish, first generation college graduate. I also had the opportunity to be a teacher in Nairobi, Kenya. I taught sixth, seventh, eighth grade math. And then after I graduated, I was a teacher in Milwaukee. I taught second grade, and I was also the after school director. And then I went to grad school and I studied electrical engineering. And then after that, I kind of just, um, I'm currently still an engineer, um, but I was able to start this company as well. And um, just the reason I started this company is growing up in an under-resourced location, I've realized that students really struggle with organization skills. We don't really teach in school you know, how to, how to learn. We don't teach students to learn how to learn. It's just a matter of here's your assignment, get it done. And because of this, students lack in organization skills, which affect executive uh, functioning skills. So that's how I developed my platform. And uh, just some background on our startup is um, we raised over $300,000. We received awards from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're working with several universities um, right now. And um, I'll dive into this. And then basically after this, uh, we're, I'm going to open it up to any questions that you might have about the company, myself, or just any ideas you guys want to bounce off. That's great, too. And I also left my business card here if you guys want to stay in touch as well. So. This is my company, it's called FlowOps. It's the integrated approach to student success. So who here has taken an online class? Okay, who here, same here, who here has dropped out from an online class? Actually, actually when you compare online versus traditional learning, you can see that students struggle more when it comes to online. In other words, the distance learning. So there's an average dropout rate of 50%, and this affects graduation rates and also retention rates. These are important metrics for higher education institutions. So we did some research, and we were able to crack down on the largest uh, distance learning programs. And we were able to look at their dropout rate. By understanding that, we were able to calculate the revenue loss of $120 million uh, academic, uh, sorry, loss every academic year, which this is a huge problem that they're trying to fix. So then why are students dropping out from these distance learning programs? It's due to research is, is because of three reasons. It's one, lack of interpersonal connection, a lack of support, and lack of motivation. So we thought about a holistic way to really improve this, and that's actually the solution. Basically, what is happening after school is as important as what's happening during school. I think that's Siri, so please uh, excuse her. So basically, through research, we can see that a holistic approach helps with community engagement, improves academic performance, and improves the retention and graduation rates. So based off our platform, we were able to do some research. Um, we, we did some pilots with some universities. For, for example, with South University, we linked up an online uh, psychology class with the academic center. And in just one semester, we were able to improve the engagement with the academic center by 43%. We also received a letter of intent. We were featured on their newsletter. And the letter of intent is for 17,000 students at $10 per user. So $170,000 potential contract just with one school. So when you guys look at the landscape, think about the platforms you guys are using. I know here at UM, you guys are using Canvas, right? But when you look at Canvas, Blackboard, excuse me, you guys are using Blackboard. So Blackboard will be somewhere over here, right? Blackboard is great when it comes to uh, instructional web-based platform, great when it comes to the desktop, but horrible when it comes to the mobile application. And the engagement is very little, right? Meaning I get my work done and then I'm done with it. But when you look at the engagement level with the social media apps, obviously it's very high. But then you also have other platforms that are just more social, more on the after school programs. So what FlowOps does is we integrate uh, the, the academics and the non-academic all into one platform, providing this mobile-centric platform. So in essence, we improve student outcome and engagement by integrating a student's academic life, social life, and educational resources all into one platform. School is more than just academics. Think about the career centers. Think about the academic center. Think about the clubs that you guys are a part of. So what we do is provide a centralized hub for communication, task management, and file sharing. 
So the way it works is we create the non-academic groups, again, like clubs, academic center, et cetera, through our dashboard. And then we integrate with the school's learning management system. In this instance, it would be a Blackboard. But this is just a quick example of how we integrate seamlessly with the school's learning management system. So imagine this is Blackboard. Under uh, the learning management system, there are different modules. Within the modules, once the educator or the professor uploads an assignment, automatically it uploads on our platform, vice versa. So if I were to modify something here, it would also modify there as well. Another thing that we do is we also upload the files. So every class has a module, and under each module, the professor can upload a file. And that would also go into our file section over here. So that's how the academic works. So once we integrate both the academic and the non-academic, now as a student, I can be aware of, I have a history essay due tomorrow, but I also have basketball practice, and I also have an academic workshop I can join via Zoom, et cetera. So now, organization-wise, you guys are basically more organized. Also, we encourage a collaboration. So basically, every professor, once they finish, they, they finish with their class, they upload a file under the module, every student has access to the PowerPoint that was done for that class. But the collaboration piece is for students, where basically after you finish class, you can take pictures of your notes, and now everyone within your class has access to those notes. That also applies for the clubs. If you guys have an event going on, you can upload flyers. That can also happen for the student athletes. You can upload footage of a basketball game or practice. And then lastly, we um, also improve communication. And the way that we do that is by creating different group chats for every group that you're part of, both academically and non-academic. So the value proposition that we bring to the institutions is the ability to improve student engagement, allows uh, schools to hit these metrics that they're aiming for, and also the ability to holistically provide a one-stop shop for task management, communication, and file sharing, improve security as well. So we are a B2B SaaS company. We sell directly to higher education institutions. We determine the yearly price per user depending on how many users are in the institution. And in regards to the, goal, uh, the target market, right now we're focused just here in Florida. But if you look at the average EdTech cost is $30. But when you look at it in an international uh, scope, you can see it's a, around a $1.8 billion opportunity. Right now we have over 12,000 active users. We have three letters of intents. In our user funnel, we have a potentially over one million students uh, that will be using our platform. We have an official partnership with Florida Atlantic University. And since we started, again, we were established in 2019, we've done so many um, accelerator programs. We won several pitch competitions, and basically we're in this area right here. Actually, just last month, we hit this milestone, which is huge when it comes to privacy and security. But with the partnership that we have with Florida Atlantic University, we apply for the National Science Foundation. And now we're working on some feedback-driven innovation that's going to be including educator analytics dashboard, gamification, and artificial intelligence. By implementing this, this is going to help us to reach 50 schools by 2025. In regards to the go-to-market, the way that we're going to do that is understanding how uh, higher ed works, right? There's different departments. Within every department, there's a decision maker, and we also have enablers. And we're going to accomplish this through our amazing team. You guys already know about myself, but my CTO, uh, she um, exited a company of, in less than a, a year. She was able to sell it for over a million dollars. Um, and also my, my Sid Beitler, my COO, he's an e-learning director at Palm Beach State College and has over 30 plus years of experience, so he's an expert when it comes to the Blackboard's learning management systems. Actually, uh, Lindsay Arrington, my marketing director, came to the school. She has done all my videos, um, all everything social media related. And these are different advisors. I have the former VP of IBM, Professor Brown, who's uh, helping us with the, um, with the National Science Foundation, and also Dr. Kevin McIntyre, who's helping us get and penetrate into um, high schools as well. So right now, we are seeking $300,000, and the whole goal is to, to grow. So for product development, custom acquisition, and team expansion, these are different milestones that's showing uh, what we're going to do with our funds. So we hope that you guys are interested. and in not. So basically, there's many ways that you guys can help out as well. Obviously, supply and demand. If you guys would love to use the application, more than happy to open that up to you guys. 
And also, if you have no people who want to invest as well, we're open to that and always we're always looking for interns. But that's pretty much it. Um, I'd, would, I would open up to any questions that you guys might have. So I'm also filming the questions and answers. OK, so I'll ask the first question, and then you can answer. OK, so you said uh, $300,000 for, for development. How much of that is marketing? Yes. Um, so this is the breakdown here. So if we're going to be using it, 33% of that is going to be going into growth. So we have come out with different marketing campaigns. Right now, we came out with one for student athletes. And actually, this is a, a quick video that we just published, which I want to share with you all. So marketing is huge, especially when working in, in higher education. So we just launched this uh, commercial uh, two weeks ago, and we've been spending a lot of money on the ads. Um, we've been also working with some influencers as well. Um, so that's also another approach. Even though I came to you guys as a distance learning platform, also when you look at student athletes, this is a huge problem that we're also trying to solve for. So we're trying to attack the market as much as we can in different angles so that holistically we can be implemented uh, inside of the, the college or university. So your target is the students and also the institutions or only the students? So the end users are the students. The ones who will be paying is the universities. Um, so basically, there's different levels. So every, for example, every department has a department chair or a director. But the ones who would pilot our platform would be, let's say, the professors or the coaches and then the end users would also be a combination of the professors and the coaches. So what we're trying to do, if you look at it as a pyramid, uh, we're trying to attack it from the top, basically the directors, and from the bottom. So it's supply and demand. So we're just trying to get as many professors and students to use the platform and, or just work through it through the directors and get it approved as well. So, but at the end of the day, it's the institutions that it's pay paying for our platform on a yearly basis. And how are you so one of the best ways is cold calling, just showing up, going to the director, speaking to them directly. I've done that with most of the universities here um, in Florida. Um, another way is just marketing online. Also, our advisors are super connected um, when it comes to the education space. So um, those are different ways that we have been getting uh, content. What type of influencers? Influencers, some student athletes that you know have a good following, um, and they just right now. We just have them reposting this uh, video that we have, and then if it's a good, if it, get, if it gets good hits, then we'll go ahead and take it a next step further, give them access to the platform, and have them talk about it. But right now, we're focused on hitting different influencers in all the different divisions within the U.S. So, like the so Big when 12. I'm sorry. When are you when are you reaching break even? Uh, I will reach break even honestly with just two contracts. Um, you know, South University offered $170,000 per year. Um, so if we close that one, all I need is another, another contract like that. And right now we're working with Palm Beach State College, which has 50,000 50, students. And we're also working with uh, Miami-Dade, um, where we're, we're still in the beginning stages. But all I need to do is land two contracts. And then my goal is to scale and grow and then sell this to like a, a Blackboard, a Moodle, uh, a Canvas, a Google Classroom, that is the goal. That's like the acquisition, and that's what the investors care about. So $300,000 in one offer, how long? $300,000 will give us about 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. All right, that's enough for you guys. Yep. So am I able to download it now for free and connect it to my Blackboard, or does mm -hmm. do Miami need to pay for it? Yeah, so that, that's, that's the tricky part, because to get trust from the institution, uh, students cannot just go ahead and download the platform. 
So short answer is no. Uh, right now you can d download the app, but you won't be able to access it. We need to work with the, uh, with the institution first so that we can integrate. The reason is because there's sensitive data. There's emails, there's names, there's grades, and stuff like that. So the reason we did it like that so that we can integrate with them first, and then basically you use your, your credentials already. You log in, and you would just see every group that you're already part of. So all your classes will already be there, and then all the clubs that you're a part of, any intramural sports, any academic center um, resources you're using, uh, it's already in there once you log in. So we're working with the top. We're just trying to make it viral right now. So let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you would use this. And be very honest. That's really good. I wish okay, I could take now, a picture. Let's say the $30 per year was not paid by UN, it was paid by you. Would you still use it? Nice. And I would not charge $30 if it's a B2C. So as you guys know, B2B is I'm selling to an institution. B2C would be like you guys download it and then you guys just pay uh, on the App Store. So if we were to ever take that route, it would not be that much. But I'm actually very surprised to see that people are still willing to pay that price. So thank you for that. Cool. Next question. Is, can you say it louder, please? Yeah, so we are, yeah, so the question was about privacy and security on file sharing. So that part, um, w what institutions are looking for is called FERPA compliant, right? So we are FERPA compliant, and we just reached this thing called SOC 2 Type 1 compliance, and that looks at privacy, security, data management plan. So when it comes to that, we, we pretty much check all the boxes when it comes to uh, file sharing. So, so that's a good question. So when um, the chats, the way it works is let's say everyone in this class will be in a group chat, right? But there's no direct messaging. Um, so the reason for that is to avoid any type of cheating or harassment, but basically it just gives you space to be like, hey, professors, class canceled today, or hey, I'm heading to um, the library. Anybody want to join me on a, on, a, on, a group, on, a, on a study session or something like that? So there's no like direct messaging. Um, we do give student accountability. What, what we aim for is to allow for students to organically engage. Because right now we did research, a lot of students are still using Blackboard, but then they're using, um, let's say, WhatsApp or GroupMe for other like clubs or stuff like that. And our goal is to kind of bring that in. And, and what we do is we have the super student um, feature where basically, let's say, the, the head of the uh, basketball club or the captain of the basketball team can go ahead and make their group and organically engage and in that group you're not going to be you know you won't see any like coaches or, or or professors that are there so again the goal is to organically engage which is not happening with the learning management systems right now what would so stop a software developer from creating the same platform what would so he asked a great question what would stop another company from creating our platform so what's great about being a startup is we have speed, right? So when you look at um, a big company, like let's say like Google Classroom, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So for you to modify something, you have to go up to the chain. So right now, what makes us different is we also have a patent pending. So we have the ability to take a picture of a schedule. You take a picture of that schedule and it uploads on our platform. So meaning you can see the deadlines, you can see the module. So that's something that's patent pending. And that's what we're doing to protect ourselves for right now. Another thing that we're doing is be, we have to be more innovative. So that's why we applied for the National Science Foundation, which basically is a, is a federal grant for like $250,000. And, and through that, we're trying to be more innovative so that we can be more unique. But as of now, if you look at the platforms that are out there today, no one is doing exactly what we're doing. But can they do it? Of course. Think about Lyft and Uber, right? You can replicate anything today. So. And, and when it comes to like protection and patent pending stuff, it's very sensitive when it comes to uh, software development as well. But if you have another barrier to entry, which is you already have made the agreement with the university, and the university really to switch, if, if it's working, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be easy for them to switch. And when they realize that, this is when companies like Google said, you know what, it's easier just to buy the company, which is what we want, mm -hmm. the investors want, than to try to be yeah, so that, but for me to get to that stage, I need to uh, have more revenue, 
right? So we do have a good, healthy pipeline, but once I have the revenue, and that's when I'll have the conversation with the burger guys. So that's typically what they do. They just buy you out instead of just reinventing the wheel. Any other questions? Yes? How are you able to find all the members on your team? Okay, great, great question. So. The first time, uh, the way I found my developer was, um, so I was, I'm, I'm, an actu I'm an engineer, right? And I work for this manufacturer. And then I met this guy who's like super successful. And then I started asking him questions on how he became success successful. And then he, uh, he's like, do you have an idea? And then I pitched this idea. I had this idea in grad school in 2014. And then he was like, I really like this idea. I want to connect you with my friend. So I, um, he connected me with her. She's the one that sold her company for over a million dollars in less than a year. And I met with her in Atlanta. I had a presentation. This is a very lame PowerPoint. And then she loved the, the idea. And then we became partners. So that's how I got my CTO. And then the way I got my COO, which is the e-learning director, I literally went to a Palm Beach State College. And I just went to the office. And I just started asking him questions about the learning management system. I knew it was bad, but he was an expert. So then um, um, I just basically, I was like, I have, a, I have an idea. And then I, kinda, I pitched it to him, and he goes, close the door. And then from there, I pitched it to him, and we've been in contact since. So he agreed to be part of our, 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 um, our team. And then for the professor, same thing. My advisors, I literally went up to FAU. I did some research on who are the people that I need, like someone who specializes on ed tech. I got their contact. I reached out to them. I pitched it, and they were like, I want to be part of your team. So honestly, it's just. Going up, showing up, asking, that's it. That's all it took. Um, but um, something that Henry Ford mentioned, which um, he, it, there was a time he was in court, and they questioned his intelligence. And he said, you know, if, I, if they ask me a chemistry question, I'm going to ask my chemist friend. So Henry Ford said that to say, like, you don't need to have all the answers. You just have to surround yourself with people who have different skill sets. And that's exactly how I thought about it. I don't know how to do the developing. I don't know, I'm not an expert when it comes to the e-learning. So that's how I kind of built my team. So in your team slide, the B2 is that guy, okay? Because in your team slide, I remember seeing some universities, but I think you need that story, maybe not as long, but say, what is that the best person to be a chief technologist? So what is your background? Mm -hmm. you know, so the story that you told, the team, you know how super important it is. Yeah. Right? When you're raising money, the team yeah. So if I see, okay, I see the technical expertise, I see the experience of somebody who already is a serial entrepreneur, has sold the company, and then, and so on. Yeah. The advisor is not so important, but the team, the core team is very important. Yeah, and adding to that, they say 80%, especially at the early stage, as you guys know, there's, there's the idea stage, there's pre-seed, seed, et cetera, right? But at the pre-seed stage where we're in, they say 80% of the decision of someone investing is, is due to the team. So. I'll do a better job in explaining this no, part. No, yeah. That, that's what this is for, too. Also. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm always question. trying to learn. Anybody else? Here. <coughs> yes. Uh, I have a question less about the product, but I was kind of wondering how your experience abroad kind of influenced and like impacted you in your professional like career being here. Or if it did. So my experience like teaching abroad? Yeah. Um, so the way I feel like the corporate world is very rigid. Um, it's more like tunnel vision. You know, you just have to, it's like survival of the fittest kind of mindset, right? So um, what helped me um, like teach was like, I've learned compassion, empathy. Um, and those are things that, you know, they, they don't really pay attention to in the corporate world. So when I taught in Nairobi, Kenya, you know, I, I, it was literally extreme poverty. I had students who their parents had HIV AIDS, I had students who had malaria. Li kids were literally drinking black water. Like you literally go into the, to the school and you see people picking up trash. Like it's extreme poverty. So what that helped me is just to be grateful. You know, uh, there's a lot of um, things that we take, you know, I, even though I came from, I, I grew up in the project, single mom, uh, three kids, and I was able to relate to them. But even my situation here in the States is way more, more blessed than what they're going through. So that gave me the sense of, of gratitude, and, and I took that with me. And then when I graduated college, um, I, I always wanted to work with little kids. The reason I wanted to work with little kids is because I always saw them happy. And I'm like, how can I always be happy in a corporate level? So when I taught, 
Um, again, I was managing 117 students for the after school program. It was kindergarten through second grade. But something I learned from, from children was that one is like you, you're always, you always give thanks. In other words, you give them a sticker, it's like they won the lottery ticket, right? Um, another thing is that they learn to um, forgive and forget like really fast, meaning Tommy hits Johnny, you'd be like, hey guys, stop, just hug it out, and they go ahead, you know? And then, um, th th so those are two kind of huge um, core elements that I took into my life before I went to grad school. So I knew I was going to, I always wanted to do engineering. So when I went into engineering, I took these things and, and kind of implemented it in my life. So now I learned how to be grateful. You know, I learned how to give things. I learned how to forgive and forget. And these are very important for me just relationship-wise. You know, think about it. You're always bumping heads. You're having conversations. So always thinking about, um, you know, these things, you know, it kind of keeps you grounded. So that, that was how that helped me become my, like, who I am today and helped me develop the person that I am today. I'm the sales guy. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, as of now, um, so what I do is when I work with some teachers, I do give them an incentive. I'm like, hey, since you're connected, if you bring me a school, I'll give you a cut. You know, so that's the education space is really def difficult. You know, um, it, it is a very long term. It's like it's literally is a marathon. Um, so you have to be very patient. So yes, that's why I'm raising capital right now is because I'm literally the lawyer, I'm the marketing guy, I'm the sales guy, I'm the product, project manager. I'm wearing many hats right now. So um, that is the goal of also raising. So I can have someone on the road, someone making the calls so that I can close sales. So whoever wants to get hired after, let me know. Anybody else? Yes. I'm going to let you guess. Thank you. 32. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How come your idea about third person in the office? I'm going to talk to Carlos <laughs> about that. No, no, sorry. no <laughs> Professor Carlos, sorry. No, it's because um, I believe, no, the other people who, um, who pitched, they did a really good job. Um, and they're also further than I am when it comes to revenue as well. Um, and I don't know, there's different criteria, but at the end of the day, I have won first place in different pitch competitions, but it pretty much comes down to the judges as well. So, you know, you can well, add. First of all, your presentation now is so much better than yesterday. Mm, thank you. And, and I don't know if you remember what I told you in the pitch competition, I was really fascinated. Yeah, he said he didn't understand what I was doing. But but I had three minutes. <laughs> yeah, I had three minutes to explain it. <laughs> yes. 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 Actually, he, the idea about student athletes actually came from him, and then that's how I was like, oh, let's start a, a campaign. So the idea of the commercial, everything. So that's also something very important is you're always learning. You know, don't be arrogant. Really, I know nothing. Um, and, and when I work with, you know, professionals, you really take that, you know, don't take, when you're building your company, everybody has something to say, but don't take everybody's idea like, oh, that's it. Like, take it as a grain of salt and then do your research. So he said that and I'm like, okay, let me fact check them. So then I go ahead and I start research, I start doing interviews uh, with coaches and students and I did see it was a problem. I was like, okay, I'm going to commit to this. And that's how we took a risk and we started this campaign for student athletes. So um, always verify if, you know, what's being suggested to you is viable as well. So what I was taught is from you, and especially your advisor, which uh, tried to jump in, was I didn't see any real evidence that this is something I was serious about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, you showed some of me and you said, would you guys like 20 people? Yeah. And, but now, everybody here raised their hand. Now they rather have Yes. In terms of interest, that is pretty good. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you should do more of that mm -hmm. in terms of getting data of how many people is interested in it. I know this is a small sample, but still, this is a real sample. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so this is, again, remember that marketing is about the customer. If the customer is not interested, then 
you're done, okay? And uh, so that was what I was questioning. I remember your professor, I think it Professor was Brown, yeah, Victoria Brown. She kept saying, yes, but I know that my students want it, and I said, where's the end? Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, and by the way, the more evidence you have, the better. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. remember that uh, people who have a lot of experience, if you don't give them evidence, they're gonna go based on their opinion. Mm -hmm. And if you have evidence, that's what I always tell my students in the exam. If you present me the evidence, there is no right or wrong answer because that is so strong. Yeah. No, it's so true. Um, that's something that it's uh, very hard to do, especially at the very young stage, uh, because you need a, hold on, I'm trying to go over here. By the way, great video. Thank you. Um, so that's one of the biggest things is like, if you don't have evidence, um, then you, it's just an idea, you know? So what we worked really hard on is to get a pilot, you know? So um, after, again, the feedback, we were able to go well, even further within our, our pilot. So now we demonstrate this is the research showing that this helps with student engagement. So these are just different things um, that we were able to, uh, to show, like 43% spike in engagement with the academic center, 33% uh, improvements in grades, 40% uh, daily uh, engagement, 30% increase on the academic center. So once, basically now, I kind of lead off my presentation uh, with this um, because it shows that it, it is, you have your proof of concept, but now you have the evidence to back it up. So I definitely agree, and the more data, the better. So I'm definitely gonna make a post, and I'm gonna, I think I counted about like 40 that said they wanted to use the platform, right? But I'll definitely make a post, something like that. Yeah, you have a question? I'm surveying my elder students. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah, he has one right here. Oh, okay. Do you see your platform changing the community, for example? Because I remember you were saying something about like the chat. Yeah. And it is pretty annoying where you have to get multiple Google chats mm -hmm. on the module. Yeah. Do you see your platform like updating, eliminating Google? No. The reason why is because that's B2C. You can download GroupMe, make your profile, make your groups, and we're B2B. In the education space, yeah. But if you really think about our platform, we're more like three in one. We're like a little bit of GroupMe, we're a little bit of Dropbox, and then we're a little bit of like a calendar feature as well. So our platform is different, like in the, in the, in the sense of just like the, the scope. Right now we're focused on higher ed, and GroupMe is more for everyone, you know. So if anything, uh, we just kind of took elements of the group feature and implemented in ours, but we won't. Yes, uh, we already have been working with some high schools already. But something else that investors want to see is that you're focused. Um, let's say if I say I want to go after kindergarten all the way to college. Actually, those are two different markets. So what we did, we had to be more focused. And then I went from high school to college. And that was, that was like, that's too broad. So then I went into college. And it's still too broad. So then I looked into distance learning. You know, so you have to find the niche. You know, and then you have to see if that niche is big enough. So that's why we did a breakdown. If you look at the all international distance learning programs and locally, um, so it's really important to be focused as well and, and investors like to see that. So you wanna figure out, you talked about this, who is the most likely buyer, mm -hmm. right? And that's where you should start. Mm -hmm. So from you know, probably bigger, higher ed, it's probably more likely to start paying for something like this than in the high school, I assume. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And sometimes it has to do also with the decision-making process. Yeah. If I was in fintech or I was in AI or something else like that, I, I guarantee you I would have raised capital way faster. But investors, for some reason, don't like ed tech because they know it is a bureaucracy. They know it's a long-term uh, sales cycle. Um, but it really also, you have to really analyze the market you're going into. If you have an idea, do your research, definitely 100%. Uh, something that I learned from FAU, uh, we had to do, I was part of an accelerator program there, but they had us interview different decision makers or potential buyers, and then you ask them non-biased questions based off your idea. And then from that, if you can get uh, an answer of 30 people, you have like 80%, 80, like this is like an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time they're saying the same message. And then from there you can determine if this is something that you really want to do. But Definitely research is super important before, you know, jumping on, on an idea. So I think earlier you said you have FI, FIU, I assume? Uh, FAU is one of our partners, Florida Atlantic University. So yeah. every single student uses your platform? No. 
So an IRB is basically a partnership that the university is going to do with us to do research. So we have a, a high school that's going to be doing research on the innovation. So in regards to the schools that are using it, right now Palm Beach State College has over 10,000 students using our platform. Um, and then we have the athletic department using it. So the girls, bas uh, the women's basketball team is using it, and then we have the baseball team as well. But that's pretty much like the big school. And then we do have some very early paying customers, which are high schools in Massachusetts, which is my old high school, and then another high school as well. So there are like data usages right now or not? Yeah. So they, they, they go through a pilot phase. Once, uh, once we finish the pilot phase, that's when we start writing the quotes, and then they determine if they want to. But while we're doing this pilot phase, so the way it works is we go to institution, and I give the platform for free. And then I say, use it for a semester. But throughout that semester, I require them to take a survey before and after. So when I, I, after the pilot ends, I take that survey and I put it on a quote, right, the, the data. And then I give them options, one year, uh, two year, three year. And obviously, there's an incentive if you go longer with us. Um, and that's pretty much like kind of the procedure. Um, so you, you have a letter of intent from who? From three, uh, three universities right now. South University, uh, Suma University, which is an online school uh, based out of South America, and then Palm Beach State College. And the letter of intent is on such day? Yeah, metrics yeah. There's metrics, yeah. So meaning, uh, so a letter of intent is basically a customer who's willing to uh, purchase your platform but you have to set different uh, metrics, right? So if you hit A, B, and C, then we'll go ahead and, and move forward with the purchase. So we have three of those letters right now. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, maybe you didn't just create like a new learning management system. The reason, uh, so, the question? so the question was, why didn't I just create a new learning management system? And one is a lot, is way more money. And then two is, is way more difficult when it comes to privacy and security and integration. So every school has a system information system. That's basically the platform you guys uh, use to register for classes. And then every school has a learning management system, which is the Blackboard, right? So if I did the LMS, I would have to tap into the SIS, which is a different journey within itself. So what we do is we're basically the mobile app. So we, are, we replace any learning management system app. We're agnostic, meaning we don't only integrate with Blackboard, we don't only integrate with Canvas, but Google, Google Classroom, Moodle, et cetera. So the, the goal is to be like, okay, this is better than, you know, Blackboard can say, this is better than my app, let me just stamp Blackboard on this and, you know, call it a day. So that's why we, we try to be agnostic. So by being mobile first, um, then we're more versatile. So that, that's the reason why we took that approach. For, yeah. Okay, I'm going to end the recording.